This video was brought to you by my patrons on Patreon. I've revamped the page for 2023 by reworking the details. $1 a month giving you access to a lively Discord server, $5 a month giving you that and early access to new videos, and lastly, $7 a month giving you all the previous rewards plus a monthly live stream and a monthly series of behind the scenes commentaries of my oldest videos, and as often as I can, exclusive videos covering my thoughts on the things I've played or watched most recently. I hope you consider joining the community. And with that said, let's get into the video properly. I don't have to remind any long-time viewers of my relationship with Sly Cooper Thieves in Time, the fourth installment in the Sly Cooper series that first released in the PlayStation 3 and PlayStation Vita in 2013. It's currently 2023, which means that it's been seven years since I first reviewed Sly 4 back in 2016. But in the time since, I've thoroughly run the topic into the ground. A fact about me that's, uh, pretty infamous to say the least. But I can explain all the details on that by the end of the video. What I will say is that if you're familiar with me from that negative history, all I'm just asking is you give this video a chance, because this series really does mean a lot to me. I mean, I bought the 20th anniversary t-shirt after all. I'm not here to hate the game, I'm just here to say some things I think are pretty interesting. Because... Despite all that talk of Thieves in Time, I never outright re-reviewed the game. The original video from 2016 has remained my only video dedicated to the subject. So a few months back when I decided to re-review the Sly Cooper trilogy, the second time, for the franchise's 20th anniversary, the biggest question for many people in my audience was, was this the time Sly Cooper Thieves in Time was going to get the re-review? My answer to that question was that it would, but not alongside the original's 20th birthday because I had a better idea in mind. The upload date of this video is Friday, February 3rd, 2023. Sly 4 released on February 5th, 2013. It has now been an entire decade since this game first released. Now, I didn't upload on the anniversary because I like uploading on Fridays, so I figured I'd remain consistent. When Sly 4 came out, Sly 3 was only 8 years old, and now Sly 4 is older than that and the gap is only going to keep going up. But speaking of Sly 3, I guess we shouldn't waste any more time and begin talking about Sly 4. To do that, we need to go back in time. On September 26th of 2005, Sucker Punch released Sly 3, Honor Among Thieves for the PlayStation 2, a game that, it turned out, was the final game in the series developed by Sucker Punch, the studio who created the series from scratch back in 2002, growing its scale and scope throughout the trilogy. Sly 3 was a game about change, and this was evident throughout the campaign, but was then made final in the game's climax as the ending saw the main trio, Sly, Bentley, and Murray, definitively give up the life of thieving for good in exchange for something even bigger. I don't know for sure, but I believe this story was meant to echo the spirit of Sucker Punch who knew going into Sly 3 that this was their final one, not because they were tired of Sly or didn't like Sly, but because they thought with the arrival of the PlayStation 3 it would be useful to them as a studio to start something new, to continue growing their talent as developers in the 3D action space instead of remaining in the same boat forever. This is how we got Infamous, which first released in the PS3 in 2009. However, Sucker Punch didn't close the book on Sly. They wrapped up their story, but decided to leave the back door open so another developer could hopefully continue the series, since again, they didn't set out to end Sly, they set out to complete their run with the series. But it seemed like, for a while, Sly 3 was the end. Until 2010. Sanzaru Games released the Sly Cooper HD Collection for the PlayStation 3, a remaster of the Sly Cooper trilogy in HD and widescreen. The Sly Collection is another thing unfairly maligned by me in the past, but again, that's not important right now. It's definitely the most accessible and easy way to play the trilogy, if you're interested in it. Provided you still have a PS3, of course. Some minor issues crop up as a result of the conversion, and some really bizarre ones happen as well. But still. The Sly Collection came with this bonus cutscene that teased Sly 4? Which ignited the fanbase as the collection was the first release in this series in five years. Seems pretty small in comparison to the current day, doesn't it? I can speak on the HD collection bringing the hype back because while I never stopped loving Sly, it was the time between beating Sly 3 and the games getting remastered where I, and probably a lot of other fans, just spent their time on other things that were coming out. In my case, the never-ending stockpile of Sonic games in the late 2000s was something to occupy your time with while it seemed Sly's story was done. But then we got to E3 2011 and one of the bigger reveals at Sony's press conference. There's one Worldwide Studios title that I personally get hundreds of emails from consumers about each year, asking, when are we bringing this franchise back to PlayStation? It's a character and franchise that has sold more than 4 million units since we first introduced it in 2002. This is a great family-friendly franchise that even hardcore gamers couldn't put down. Let's take a quick look. Yeah. 
Sly Cooper Thieves in Time, the long-awaited sequel to Sly 3, was going to be released in 2012 and was being developed by Sanzaru Games. They had begun development on Sly 4 before the HD collection, pitching their idea for a Sly sequel to Sony in the late 2000s as a handheld game, but Sony commissioned the team to do an HD trilogy and that's how the gears started turning for the full PS3 sequel. The original pitch presentation from Sanzaru Games to Sony was suddenly something we could imagine before recently as Sanzaru talked about pitching Sly 4 to Sony and that leading to the HD collection during the interviews for Sly 4, but as I said, recently the entire presentation has become publicly available. It was sold on eBay and is now a treasured part of the Sly community. You can see the game running on the prototype of the PlayStation Vita, its would-be online features, sales projections, budget projections, series, sales trends, and the list goes on. It's pretty interesting. If you're a fan of the series and want some insight into how games get greenlit, this is an interesting showcase. This history and context is necessary as, with this game being 10 years old, I want to look at its history and my history with it from all sides, past, present, and future. So where was I? E3 2011. I was over the moon at the reveal of this game. Only thing was, the trailer didn't have any gameplay, but the show floor did, so we got plenty of interviews from GameSpot, IGN, and all the others. I soaked that stuff up like a sponge. I genuinely think I watched every single interview pertaining to Sly Cooper Thieves in Time imaginable throughout its almost two-year-long pre-release. Thanks to that, I can tell you the media coverage in this game was much more sporadic compared to bigger games coming out, like you'd see the game at PAX 2011 in August and then not see it again until March 2012. I suppose this is pretty normal for games in hindsight, however, if you're a kid with few better things to do than spend all day thinking about how good this game was going to be, then that time with no news was pretty agonizing. Especially when the game got delayed in August of 2012 from its generic holiday 2012 release date to February of 2013. Something done to avoid such a niche game having to compete with the holiday 2012 roster of games. While waiting for this game, what I spent quite a lot of time doing was replaying the Sly trilogy again and again to make sure I was ready for the new one. Something I thought would enhance my experience with Sly 4, but in hindsight probably didn't help now that I was one of those fans who knew the games inside and out. But hey, Sly 4 was the most hyped I had ever been for a game at the time, which is saying a lot considering what else was coming out at the time, but this was how I expressed that excitement. After all that build up, the interviews, the trailers, the announcement of the Vita port, the animated short, the character trailers, <laughs> Shrimp cocktail! The gradual showcase of the levels, bosses, and Cooper ancestors, the delay, the replaying of the old games, the school days spent thinking about how this game was going to turn out, it finally released on February 5th, 2013. It was certainly a life-changing experience, just not the one I thought it would be. The first playthrough of Thieves in Time was so bizarre. I'm trying to recall memories from 10 years ago now, but what I recall was that I spoiled the plot rotten on YouTube, and then I got to play the game where I instantly fell in love with it. I said on day one that the first level showed the game was a contender for the best in the series, but by the time I finished it, I remember thinking, it was good, but something about it didn't seem right. As the months rolled by and I did a second playthrough, I was thinking, no, this one is definitely the worst in the series, but it was okay, uh, right? By early 2014, I had made up my mind. This game is awful! The writing is such a downgrade, the story is trash, the gameplay is nowhere near as good as the trilogy, it makes Sly 3 look like Sly 2, Sanzaru has killed my childhood! This is the status quo I remained in for the next year or so, until I played it again in 2015 and thought, well the game was better than I remembered, but the writing manages to be worse. Late 2015 is when I finally started doing YouTube videos, something Sly 4 Extra made me want to do because nobody on YouTube was really saying what I was feeling about the game. And that's when we finally got to the review in the summer of 2016 where I concluded that the game was better than I remembered, but the story was even worse. As the video included several explosive rants on said story, but felt like the game, barring some issues, was a decent gameplay experience. They focused on making this game play well, and if you are a Sly fan that just appreciates the parkour gameplay and not much else, Sly Cooper Thieves in Time is right up your alley. But that might not be how you remember it, because following that video in 2017, I decided to start making it my personality to hate the game, which became the dominant narrative, despite what the original review might have said. As stated before, this is something I'll talk in more detail about at the end of the video. What matters now is, a lot has changed with time. I'm 22 years old now, this game is 10 years old now, the game has received no sequel and in my opinion never will, for reasons we can discuss later. Besides merely turning into an adult, it's hard to be mad at this game because, well, it's been 10 years. Why continue to burn it to the ground, when all that's left is ash anyway? Similar to Mega Man X6 last year where I went back to a game I gave a scathing review and decided to not re-review it, but simply do a follow-up to the original where I would try to be nice to it. 
hence the title Learning to Love Mega Man X6. My intentions here are similar to that. Today we're going back to Sly Cooper Thieves in Time to see, now that the dust is settled, what do I think of this game? Is it good, is it bad, or is it somewhere in between? This isn't going to be a comprehensive deep dive on its mechanics because I don't really feel like making that kind of video. I want to follow up on the original and cover what this game did well and how I feel about it as a package 10 years later. So let's start with those positives. Here's an obvious one. Sly 4 absolutely trounces in the original trilogy in terms of production value. This should be expected given the fact that the Sly trilogy were PS2 games, ones that didn't have the kind of resources that other studios like Insomniac Games and Naughty Dog did, and as a result, the Sly games had rather stiff in-game cutscenes that would recycle a lot of the same pre-baked animations multiple times. They made up for that with appealing character designs and quality art direction that made each environment pop, regardless of the limitations. However, Sly 4 being released towards the tail end of the PS3 era is leaps and bounds ahead of what the trilogy was capable of. Just looking at the animation, I think Thieves in Time is some of the best looking cartoony animation I've seen in a game. Compared to Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart, which released on PS5 in 2021, that game is definitely the best cartoon animation I've seen, but in a Pixar movie kind of way. In Sly 4, the movements of the characters and cutscenes is a joy to watch because it has that Saturday morning cartoon kind of vibe that the trilogy was trying to achieve, only fully brought to life. Each scene is packed full of motion, expressive facial animations, eyes being used to emphasize reactions, cartoony effects like Bentley's neck being extended when shocked or whatever, there are a lot of in-game cutscenes and Binocucom cutscenes in Thieves in Time, and the level of detailed animation in them is a sight to behold across the entire campaign. You clearly can't say this was a phoned-in effort, as Sanzaru's love of the Sly series shines through into how much effort they put into it from a production standpoint. Bringing back the composer from Sly 2 and 3, Peter McConnell, to do the score for Thieves in Time. I think on a sheer quality and variety standpoint, this might be his best work. The fact that Sly 4 sees the gang traveling to different points throughout history allowed McConnell to work with different styles of music meant to not only reflect different countries like prior games but also different time periods, while also still having that distinct Sly Cooper sound. Remixing great tracks from prior Sly games like the Paris Rooftops from Sly 2, the Venice Espionage from Sly 3, and even something obscure like the Bentley Hacking minigame theme from Sly 1 gets remixed for the Alter Ego minigame, and that was from a different composer entirely. It's a great soundtrack with lots of upbeat energy but also atmosphere when required. Although, I wish the late game tracks would have laid off the xylophone, but that's just a nitpick on my end. The only area I don't like this game from a production standpoint would be its animated cutscenes. If you were to think of an easy way to improve from the old games, it would be making them full motion, right? While each game added more motion to these scenes, the point was still that they were like graphic novels to bookend each level, and I think that is missing here. But then, I just generally don't care for the art style as the characters look really off-model and unappealing in many of the scenes. So I guess full motion wasn't the main issue, it's just that I don't care for the style that they went with. But to return to the things this game gets right, its visuals in the gameplay are definitely on the list. Sly 4 looks fantastic to this day. Its textures and environments look simple when you stop and observe them, but it fits in this cartoony world. Where the game shines is in its lighting and atmosphere. I'm always taken aback by the way the sun or moon shine in the sky and how the shadows look whenever I play this game. All this being bolstered by a target of 60 frames per second. Sly 4 does not have a perfect frame rate, but it stays in the 50s range enough to where I see this game is held up in terms of performance in a way that many 7th gen games have not. Ratchet & Clank A Crack in Time might have looked more realistic, but then has dated textures and resolution compared to what exists now and had considerable performance costs. Not to say Sly 4 isn't compromising on anything, but that's getting ahead of ourselves. I just think the game looks great. But then you might wonder, how does Sly 4 fare as a gameplay experience, going back to it after all these years? Well, the answer is that Sanzaru Games did quite a lot to expand the foundations of Sly gameplay and do a lot of interesting things with it. My only major gripe with playing Sly 4 is that I think the characters don't feel as good to play as they used to. The controls are the exact same as previous Sly games, interacting with things using the circle button, attacking on square, special attacks on triangle, sprinting on R1, and so on. The difference is that the characters are much heavier than they used to be. In Sly 2 and 3 in particular, Sly was pretty much weightless. You could turn on a dime, jump in any direction without effort, land from high rooftops and start moving immediately upon landing, and the list goes on. In Sly 4, turning around may see you stop and you turn. Jumping feels a lot heavier, which messes with my muscle memory in platforming, and landing has a large impact, and you have to spend that extra second or two in recovery. These things must sound minor, and they are, however my muscle memory is messing with me when I play Thieves in Time because I'm just so used to the old games that I might miss jumps I'd easily make in Sly 2. However, if you never suffered the Sly Trilogy addiction, this probably won't be on your radar while playing. And speaking of radars, that brings me to the fact that the model of gameplay is exactly like Sly 2 and 3. There are five worlds in Thieves in Time where you play as Sly, Bentley, Murray, and Carmelita as you get introduced to a new Cooper ancestor in each stage who you also play as who brings his own special abilities to the gameplay. 
In each world, you do a preliminary mission as Sly as you get to grips with the hub world and then do more missions as the other characters to set up for the heist, which is the final mission of the level. The developers took advantage of the PS3's technical capabilities to generate much larger worlds than you got on PS2. The total surface area in Sly 4's hubs are usually larger than most areas of 2 and 3, however the areas come with more branching pathways and verticality too, in that there will be higher sections, lower sections, and platform to get between them, rather than just having the usual rooftops and streets like the previous games did. To get around, you can use the holographic markers in the sky like the last two games, but you also get a full map with the press of select. But then in the bottom right, you get a mini-map that will lead you to important destinations like the map in, say, Jack 2. This is not something that was required in the previous game since the areas were small enough to make holographic markers enough of an indication on where to go. And this wasn't even something that was going to be in the game from the beginning. I remember that in an interview, Matt Kramer, lead designer of the game, said that playtesters thought a mini-map would be useful and then it ended up in the game. Really demonstrating that Sanzaru was open to feedback and willing to change things, something that was said in that very same interview. I don't feel like digging up receipts though, I'm pretty confident it was E3 2012, so just uh, take my word for it. How I feel regarding Sly Cooper gameplay has evolved quite a lot over the years. To the point where in my final review of Sly 3, I had said I was starting to see the appeal of the added variety because it helped break up the monotony of the core gameplay, an issue that Sly 2 suffered from, especially from my perspective. Where Sly 3 failed was how in half of that variety was a good way to shake up the pace, but the other half was completely boring button mashing nontent. But in principle, I liked the idea. Sly 4 has plenty of variety, just without the aimless one-off minigames that Sly 3 had. Here, each episode has roughly the same number of missions as Sly 2 and Sly 3, around 8 to 9 per world, but the game gets more mileage out of them by making them much longer and involve more platforming than just doing tasks. Instead of having more than one pickpocketing mission in one world, you'll have a mission where you need to pickpocket three things to create the samurai armor that you use to get into the prison, which is an entire level in and of itself. The game still gives us all the sly mission tropes, but without having to use them again and again because it crafts longer missions out of them. The biggest win with Sly 4 was that Sanzaru put a lot more focus on the platforming than Sucker Punch did when doing Sly 2 and 3, like I said. There are a lot of missions in Thieves in Time where you'll be forced to use Sly's mechanics in ways the games don't really tend to, like having to time where you move on this neon pipe in accordance with the lasers. Sly 3 had a lot more platforming than Sly 2 to be sure, but I think Sly 4 consistently brings platforming to the front and center of the gameplay experience, and I think it was for the better. The game also cuts out the worthless upgrades, but keeps in essentials with the paraglider and adds new ones that are stellar, like different types of bombs for Bentley or shot types for Carmelita. Always love using the bomb kick for Bentley, it's just way more satisfying than the trigger bomb ever was. But my favorite new upgrade is the rail sprint, an essential upgrade that allows Sly to do as the name suggests, running on rails much faster. Point is, the game has a lot of diverse content while keeping things simple and organized. Sly 3 had a total of 8 playable characters, and that was because of the gang's expansion for the Cooper Vault job. Sly 4 keeps things more consistent in that the core cast is still Sly, Bentley, and Murray, but this time Carmelita is a member of the team, and you'll play as her in select segments. But then the extra gameplay comes from each level having a playable Sly ancestor, each with their own special attacks and unique gimmicks, like Ryoichi flying from point to point, Galath getting a shield to ram enemies with, Selim being able to fly up poles, and Bob Cooper climbing on ice walls. Best of all being Tennessee Kid Cooper, whose cane is also a gun. Here they have a pretty fun third-person shooting gameplay style, as the aiming feels really good and the crack shot technique is always satisfying to use. Carmelita also benefits from this improved shooting, as with both her and Tennessee, it's easy to hit targets, but not so mindless that it almost plays itself, like in Sly 3 with this ludicrously big reticle. When purely looking at the gameplay of Sly 4, it's hard to get bored of it because there's always something new to do. Like how Bentley gets three different hacking minigames, one that's an expanded version of the Sly 2 and 3 style with different cyber vehicles to control and use, Another is this twin-stick shooter that feels like the kind of minigame you play in Sly 1, and then the entirely original 6-axis hacking game. Although I never liked this one, or any of the forced 6-axis controller minigames. It's really clunky to play and leads to deaths that don't feel like your fault, and also just feels several years out of date, considering the most PS3 exclusives stopped using 6-axis in like 2008, and this game was released in the same year as the PlayStation 4. But as I was saying, the game comes with a lot of replay value, like how Sly gets new costumes in each world that gives him a special ability, like the samurai armor deflecting fire, or the prison suit giving you a ball and chain to hit crates with. In past games, once you finished a world, there was almost no reason to come back to it. But Matt Kramer, lead designer, said that Metroid was his favorite game and wanted to inject some of that kind of item-based exploration into the world of Sly 4. By that, I mean you'll see buckets with arrows in them in Episode 1, however, you don't have any way to interact with them until Episode 4, and that gives you the idea to go back to previous worlds and see what you can find and get rewarded with treasures that allow you to buy more upgrades from the shop. 
It's taking things that have worked in previous games like the replayability of Sly 1 levels, the fun of treasure hunting in Sly 2, and mixing them together. This game is just filled with creative gameplay ideas and segments, like Tennessee and Carmelita teaming up to rescue the gang, with Carmelita shooting enemies from the boat and Tennessee climbing up and clearing the path, eliminating the enemies on the side. Or Sly using his time-slowing thief suit from Episode 5 to carefully navigate from one side of this rushing water to another. A pretty compelling Sly platforming segment, which is usually not how it goes in these games. When looking at these gameplay ideas alone, it's very easy to see that Sly 4 could be a contender for the best game in the series. If you enjoy Sly mostly for the gameplay, then these are fair reasons why you'd think this is the best game in the series, or deserving of the title. You know, consistent, streamlined game design, I totally get it. I think this game does a lot of good and brings many creative ideas to the Sly table. However, even looking at the game divorced from any critique beyond the act of playing the game, I can only ever conclude that this is my least favorite game in the series and there's one singular reason why. The abysmal loading screens. This is the one thing pretty much everyone agrees with on Thieves in Time. The loading is nightmarish. I seriously forgot it was this bad. For the video, I played the game on original PS3 hardware and the loading was legendarily bad. Here's how. Leaving the safe house, entering the safe house, or any area in the game that's not the hub world will begin a loading screen these go on for, at minimum, 30 seconds. I timed it. The first time I left the hub world in episode 1 saw me waiting at this loading screen for 46 seconds. Almost an entire minute of staring at black nothing. The first loading screen in episode 5 took a minute and 12 seconds. It is ridiculous. Bad loading really can kill a game because it brings the pace down to a screeching halt this being one of the worst cases of it I have ever seen. Now, Sly 4 isn't nearly as inefficient with its loading like Sonic 06 and its baffling town missions and all that, thus being more shocking to experience than Sly 4, but looking back at it, Thieves in Time has, pound for pound, some of the longest loading screens I've ever seen, that's compared to the likes of Mega Man X7 or Sonic 06, some of the most poorly optimized games I have played. But then other PS3 games with more complex visuals also don't have this problem. I'm not sure why it loads for so long, like did Sony's wanting a Vita port for crossplay features create some kind of data management issue? I have no idea. But playing Thieves in Time tires me out by the end because of the loading. To hammer this home, my first session of footage was everything from the start of the game to the end of episode 1. That session was 2 hours and 1 minute. I decided to load this in the editor and remove all the loading screens and that reduced it to an hour and 48 minutes. 13 minutes of this session was loading. Almost 10%. Stretch that out across the entire game and you have a 10 and a half hour game where an entire hour of it is this. But thankfully, the story doesn't end there. That's right, gamers. I'm about to tell you that you can play Thieves in Time removed from the horrific loading screens. Well, not officially. I'm no stranger to emulation and thankfully my computer can handle our PCS3, the lead PS3 emulator. Naturally, one of the first games I played on it was Thieves in Time. This was how I have revisited this game in recent years, and this is also why going back to the game on console was so jarring, because believe it or not, the loading screens are far shorter when playing the game 10 years later on a PC emulator. Example, that 46 second load screen I mentioned a few moments ago lasted 13 seconds on PC. This is a night and day change. That is 70% shorter, making the entire game about an hour shorter, allowing you to just focus on the gameplay experience and thus have far more fun than you would playing it on the PS3. Like I said, I played this game on PC back in 2022 at some point and was surprised at how much more I enjoyed it than usual. But going back to the PS3 has revealed it all. It was the loading screens. They were that bad. But our PCS3 also comes with other benefits, like how you bump up the resolution with no cost to performance. Thieves in Time looked really good on PS3 at 720p, but playing it in 4K with no loading screens is like a completely different game. The visuals shine like never before and the game feels much better paced without all that dead air. Not to say this is a supremely accessible option for many people, but the option does exist for anyone curious about it. The reason I didn't do my playthrough for this video on the emulator was because I noticed that the frame rate was a little choppy for me, which is something I wasn't too bothered by when playing, since the original version didn't have a perfect frame rate anyway, but then it was also kind of choppy at certain intervals in the footage, which I thought would make for a poor viewing experience. I just need to upgrade my CPU. So in the meantime, I opted to play the game on the OG hardware and was then taken aback by how much of an effect the loading has on the game as without it, I was truly able to appreciate things about this game I never did before, like how it brought so many great ideas to the table unfocused on platforming like I said a few moments ago. But that begins the problem, the massive asterisk that comes with my praising Sly 4's gameplay. I don't play Sly for gameplay. Well, definitely not because of the gameplay solely. This is something that tracks back to my first discovery of Sly Cooper on the shelves of Target back in 2004 or whatever. Seeing Sly 2 and instantly being magnetized to the art style and character designs. 
I repeatedly hammered this throughout my final videos in the trilogy. Sly was much more of a total package kind of game. I feel like Sly's gameplay model of pressing the circle button to automatically interact with ropes and spire jump points holds the series back in many ways. It makes the platforming very trivial, even in Thieves in Time where there's so much more of it and they do a lot more with it, it's hard to really get into the platforming like I could in other games from my childhood that I've also played a lot like Ratchet and Jack. Jumping and pressing the circle button has a 0% chance of failure and a generous range, barring my not being used to the physics of Thieves in Time. Something the first Sly has to its advantage over its sequels, speaking as someone who's played them all an uncountable amount of times, is replay value. Sure, Sly 1 has this problem of automation as well, but the difference is that the game was plenty challenging the first time around with its hit points and lives, but then it has the time trials where the gameplay model was based around absolute pixel-perfect runs that required in-and-out knowledge of the stage and every possible shortcut or way to go faster. For that reason, I now find Sly 1 the most mechanically compelling game in the series to play. I went over this at the end of the last Sly 3 video, and I had said that I'm not going to hold the relative ease of Sly 2 through 4 against the games too hard because you realize it wasn't an accident that the games were like this. I find Sly games quite easy because I have been obsessed with them for almost 20 years, but I could name countless missions that when actually playing them as a kid on PS2 left me stumped for a long time. A lot of those were minigames, but still. The Sly Cooper games were created to be challenging kids games that were fun for the whole family, and to that end, they succeeded. I could try speedrunning and that sort of thing, but I don't feel like Sly 2 through 4 are the kind of games where that would even be fun because of how many unskippable cutscenes you have to try and find a way around. As stated in the last Sly video, I ran the games into the ground and now it's hard for me to find them that fun to play, especially since mechanically they aren't offering much to the adult player that the more challenging platformers are, like say, Crash Bandicoot. So what's left then? Well, in the Sly Cooper trilogy, you had the story, which I think carried the entire experience and elevated every single aspect of the games, as I've been saying for years now. I went into this in last year's Sly 2 video. There are no other games with this unique heist setup gameplay model executed to such a fine degree with a compelling story on top of that, which makes the game live rent-free in your head. The way every aspect of the experience worked in tandem to create a great game was something really special about that trilogy. So where does that leave Thieves in Time? Well, as I alluded to earlier, I have a new perspective on this game as a game, and like always, I like the writing even less than before, which I really didn't think was possible at this point. I think the story of Sly 4 is just... bad. I'm going to make this quick because at this point I've gone over these issues a hundred times and yet they manage to irk me more and more with each playthrough. And I'm up to nine playthroughs of this game at this point after ten years. First, you have the fact that the characters are significantly reduced in complexity compared to the original games. Sly's witty nature has turned into his entire character as he needs to come up with some kind of witty line to barf out in every scene. What made him cool before was his quick wit, but also calm demeanor and determination to see his missions through and his care for his friends. He was a well-rounded character in all three games. Bentley made it out of this game relatively unscathed because the comedy that came from his character in the trilogy is largely how they write him in this game, and it's pretty entertaining for the most part. Specifically the deadpan sarcasm he gives out. The quips, not as much, but we can get to that later. Murray, though, was reduced to the muscle that's obsessed with food, something that, yes, happened before, but mostly in Sly 1, compared to this game where he mentions something about hunger and food pretty regularly and has this mediocre attempt at a character arc, where he finally discovers his usefulness after he can't climb an ice wall. A far cry from his trilogy-long arc about the very same thing from a much more genuine place of feeling useless compared to Sly and Bentley. And then, Carmelita is just awful in this game, going from the tough and badass cop busting criminals into, well as the game describes, the ex-girlfriend, where most of her character is dealing with her relationship with Sly and little else. Though, there really isn't much else for her to do in this time-traveling story anyway, given the fact that she can't be arresting people hundreds of years in the past. But regardless, I think this is a woeful showing for Carmelita, as she's only playable in like three missions across the entire campaign, and contributes so little to the story in the moment-to-moment -moment action that cutscenes like the Galath one after the rescue don't even feature her, despite being in the safe house where she is. Her inclusion and entire character design feels much more like fan service than anything else, and it shows when replaying this game. Especially considering the ways in which the media landscape has improved in the depictions of female characters in just the last 10 years alone. It just makes the laughably contrived setup of Carmelita having a belly dance to distract these guards in Episode 5 feel even more cringeworthy than it was 10 years ago. The plot has issues down to the fundamentals, as it's just built off the back of coincidences and contrivances. You need an item from that era to time travel, because that makes sense. But in order to do that, the story repeatedly contrived reasons for that to happen, like, ooh, the goons dropped a gold coin, guess that gets us to the next level, or thankfully, Carmelita just happened to have an ancient Arabian coin. Now we're in business. Oh wow, what a coincidence. Carmelita got tossed into Le Paradox's time machine and just so happened to show up exactly where we were in time. 
The story is just littered with that sort of writing. Time travel doesn't actually exist, so you just have to make up how it works in whatever story you're telling, and my standards with this are not even that high. I accept the story of Avengers Endgame without even thinking much about how the mechanics of time travel actually work. But then, whenever I look at this game's story, it just makes my head implode from the fact that it's complete nonsense. Like how history is rewritten enough by Le Paradox's crew for the Thievius Raccoonus pages to disappear, but somehow Sly himself doesn't cease to exist. Or how Le Paradox legitimately rewrites history to make himself king of the world, but they still use an item from the unaltered timeline to return home? When it's clearly a new timeline, right? The world is saved by beating Le Paradox and he's arrested, but then... for what crime? Rewriting history? Wouldn't his entire scheme be wiped from history anyway? Hasn't the entire series been altered now? Things of that nature. And look, I'm trying to skim over this sort of thing right now, because I don't want to make a long nitpick compilation because it really isn't important. These aren't real issues that get in the way of the story. You could, for lack of a better phrase, cinema sins any story in existence if you really wanted to. The sheer number of potential plot holes a person could poke out of a plot doesn't really speak to that story's value and instead just shows how much free time I have. Plus, I've been over this a thousand times. I'm not interested in going over all the same negative talking points to the same level of depth as I have in the past because a roast of Thieves in Time isn't why I'm here, I'm just trying to express how I experience the story. I've thought about this six ways from Sunday and I always end up thinking the writing was worse than I remembered. I mean, if you look at this game as a legitimate continuation of the plot from the trilogy, then it fails for the reasons of characterization I mentioned before, but then the dramatic beats they introduce fall flat in their face, because they won, throw away compelling drama in 10 seconds like Carmelita learning Sly was lying, then build the entire game around Sly trying to regain her trust because he returned to thieving to save the future, which completely ignores his intention to do it before that even happened. But as time went on, the old itch came back, and I knew I needed to pull a heist. Thus rendering the entire drama moot from Sly's side because he's full of it. Or two, they contrive drama like Penelope betraying the gang in one level for reasons that don't make sense. I mean, she wants to get rich? They invented time travel. That seems like Nobel Peace Prize material to me. But then the entire plotline is introduced and wrapped in about 15 minutes and is not relevant to the characters again. It's a Sly game, so there's got to be a Sly 2 level twist. But it just fails. But then I thought about it. Maybe Sly 4 was meant to be a comedic reunion of sorts, and when looking at it from that perspective, it makes the most sense, but I still think it fails. This was the area where the game's story went down in my estimation yet again. Thieves in Time, like many platformers from the mid-2010s, just bombards the players with attempts at humorous dialogue. In cutscenes, in gameplay, it doesn't matter. The game tries as hard as possible to be funny via pop culture references, Sly being weaponizably obnoxious in mission briefings, or just an onslaught of verbal diarrhea in gameplay. The Sly games were littered with dialogue from the beginning, but mostly tutorial-type dialogue and a lot of that spam was towards the beginning of the game. By the end, the mission starts, you play, and that's that. Here, the characters will comment on every random thing, or just trade quips like it's nobody's business. No way I'm going out as egg salad! Huh? 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 I'll never eat an omelet again! Hey, don't forget, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Ugh, I'd much rather sleep in late. Sometimes cutting themselves off with more dialogue. Let me in, Sly. Time okay, to drop Sly, the one in the back. Here on that thing. Magic. It feels almost non-stop, and I don't think a single joke lands in this entire game. To get past this, here's what you can do. Go in the options and hit the dialogue volume slider and reduce it to absolute zero. Then, when a cutscene plays, pause and hit the skip button. During cutscenes that let you skip them, that is, because some don't. This is also what I did when I played this on the emulator. Genuinely, Sly 4 in 4K, decent load times and with no dialogue, saw the game rise by several points in my estimation. But the annoying dialogue was yet another thing going against the game in my playthrough of it this time. But I would also like to wrap this up soon, so let's get to the point. To give Sly 4 shade for being a goofy kids game is unfair, I realize, because here's the fact I've come to terms with. Sly was always a cartoony kids game. I spent so long in the 2010s talking about the Sly trilogy as the most serious of Shakespearean art, but that's just not what it was ever meant to be. 
To seriously examine the themes of Sly Cooper, you just have to pretend this isn't a series where you play a game of Voodoo Simon Says, or cheat in the Lumberjack games by attaching bright yellow cables to Jean Besson's back to pull him off the rock climb and somehow have the judges not see this ridiculously obvious ruse. Or climb up giant Carmelita's bootlaces. I never thought Sly being for kids was a great defense for Thieves in Time when people used it in the past, because that just begs the question of why we're even playing it to begin with if it's above criticism on a story level, since I don't feel like the gameplay is compelling enough to keep us coming back on its own, but maybe I'm in the minority there. Perhaps many do think Sly's gameplay is what it's all about, I just don't. I now watch the dramas put out by AMC and HBO on all that, so it's much easier to see in hindsight that yeah, Sly was always a cartoony series for kids with wacky setups and characters. Sly 4 is no different in that sense. And that was something that was always a lot of fun in the OG trilogy. Like, I'm not saying the Lumberjack games are bad because it's so ridiculous and obvious. It's pretty funny. I enjoy it, and then it switches to serious a moment later. And this is the critical difference. While the Sly trilogy was targeting a younger audience, I feel like it was written in a more compelling fashion. The devil's in the details here. The dialogue in Thieves in Time isn't just trying to be funny constantly but it lacks the subtle humor the old games had in dialogue, or the deadpan nature of its humor. Any problems with that guy? Said he wanted to be buried in his mom's pasta sauce. Yeah, that's, uh, that's strange. Kids media can have the power to leave a massive impact on that target demographic, and I was an example of this with Sly. Sly was a character who spoke in an intelligent manner, the likes of which I had never heard before. It's a well-fortified, gothic nightmare that would make any thief run in terror. Terrible or not, that's where we're headed. Part of what made the script so memorable to me was how smart it sounded, which is why I know it so well today. The claw gang had been defeated, and the clockwork parts lay scattered around in heaps. Yet, despite the explosion, they remained pristine. It was as if nothing could ever hurt them. The trilogy, even with its target audience, naturally built character arcs from Game 1 to Game 3, letting players sit in the moments of victory and defeat. It was a well-told story. Maybe not the greatest story of all time, but a well-told story nonetheless. One that I find very endearing. One that I'd hope to show my own kids if I ever get to that point in life. And all of that is what I think is lacking in the fourth one. Dialogue just being more plain and obvious in comparison to what's come before. Thanks, guys! I guess this makes up for all my screw-ups lately. Murray, we all make mistakes. It happens. But it doesn't matter because we're a team and we all have each other's backs. That's why we're unbeatable. Yeah, what he said. Today, you were the hero, Murray. And don't you forget it. I think Sly had a limited shelf life and in hindsight didn't need to go past the third one. The whole message of Sly 3 was about moving on and letting go of things when the time was right. In retrospect, I kind of think the time travel sequel hook was a mistake. The fact that this story has to contrive almost every plot point is further evidence that perhaps there was something incredibly unnatural about a time traveling Sly game. The series was better left as that complete story than get to go on for the sake of going on and ending on what I believe is one of the worst endings in a video game. A cliffhanger that has gone unresolved for 10 years and in my opinion never will be resolved. Apparently, Sony promised Sanzaro they'd get to do DLC and provide a conclusion for the story, but just never followed up. PS3 era Sony did some weird stuff and screwed over a lot of developers like that. But that's not really important here. I said in the last Sly 3 video that when the game was released, the target audience didn't get the message of Sly 3, and of course we didn't. The target audience was like 6 to 10. The fanbase wanted to see that time travel sequel hook be brought to life, and here it is. But another thing I've realized is that... I failed to learn the lesson of Sly 3 even more so after Sly 4 than I ever did before. Now we get to one of my video ending rambles, so buckle up. I already told the story from the game's release that led to my review of it in 2016. But on that day, I intended for that to be the end of the story and I'd move on. As for myself, I think this will be my first and last time making a video on this game. But then, later in 2016, I began to re-review the trilogy for the first time. In this series, I had the goal of using my more in-depth framework to see how the trilogy holds up in comparison to the criticisms I gave Sly 4 in the review. However, this goal quickly transformed from something meant to provide additional context to those criticisms into using Sly 4 as a comedic scapegoat at every turn imaginable, as a substitute for having something interesting to say. My Sly 3 review from Spring 2017 is a perfect example. I never brought up Sly 4 in a serious capacity in that video. It was instead a constant barrage of jabs and jokes at its expense. 
What a terrible storyline. Like, seriously, what happened? The Paradox just jumps off the blimp and gets hit in the face with a plane? You've got to be kidding me. Oh, wait, I'm talking about Sly 4 again. Hating Sly 4 became a core tenet of my personality on YouTube and off of YouTube, I won't lie. This went on for a long time. Even after I was long done covering Sly, I still went out of my way to tear into it as often as humanly possible. Like this example from my Sonic Heroes review from 2020. But certainly that's something I feel like making a big stink about. After all, this game is in Sly 4. Yeah, don't bother coming up with an interesting way to make a point, just bash Sly 4. That's an easy segue, right? It was incredibly lazy and predictable on my part. I mentioned at the start that I only reviewed Sly 4 the one time, but it wouldn't seem like that since I used every chance I had to undermine it. Not just bringing it up in countless videos as the never-ending bad example, but then also contriving videos into existence for the purpose of putting it down, like podcasts, retrospecting the series, used to make fun of the game yet again. One of the 10 things that suck about Sly Cooper Thieves in Time? Well, here you go. Or that deleted Sly 4 is non-canon video. And one time we were joking about how the only way we'd be happy is if Sly 4 was just wiped clean from the canon so we never have to worry about it or its stupid cliffhanger ending ever again. Which sent us down a rabbit hole of inconsistencies that all but confirmed that the Sly Cooper of the original trilogy and the Sly Cooper of Thieves in Time are not one in the same. You could say we were stating a case and giving evidence, but it was more than anything else an attempt to make fun of this game. Then there were live streams done to take the piss out of the game, and the list goes on, really. But that extended to also using the developer, Sanzaru Games, as a comedic scapegoat as well. This is the most important thing. Sly 4 is just a game. It'll live. But Sanzaru is a group of people who work hard in the things they do. For me, to engender an attitude of belittling them in my audience is behavior I cannot rationalize or justify. The best I can do is tell you that a lot of beginning YouTubers fall into the cliché trap of making a game developer or a game their arch enemy in their videos. A cringeworthy and outdated trope. I wanted to make Sanzaru for me what LJN was for the angry video game nerd. Key difference is that the AVGN is clearly supposed to be a hyperbolic character, not a genuine reflection of how James feels and acts, when I had no such pretense on my channel. He was also raging on dumb licensed games from at the time 20 to 25 years ago. I mobilized people to hate in a developer that currently exists, and if any hate ever reached the eyes and ears of the people who work at Sanzaru, I'm sorry, and I always was the one who was in the wrong. Obsessing with hating this game both because I thought it was fun and because it became such a routine in my show that I thought it had to continue. Until I saw, following the release of my Sonic 06 review in 2020, just how hated and how infamous I was for this in particular. Known for hating a relatively obscure game that most people like. I earned that criticism, and from that day forward I never did it again. Not a single one of my videos in 2021, 2022, and right now possess a random rant at the expense of Sly 4. Some of them even using it as a positive example, like the re-review of Secret Agent Clank. And speaking of which, in the original cut of that video from summer 2021, I had addressed this very issue. However, I later removed it before that video was released because of the fact that I thought, only six months or so removed from when I first saw how much people hated this routine of mine, that an apology from me would seem performative. So I decided to just let my actions speak louder than words. So like I said, I owe Sanzaro an apology for bashing them as much as I did. I'm now an adult, not a dumbass teen, and I was gonna act like it. Maybe that cut was a mistake since I'm still known for that amongst many people online who still hate me with everything they've got based purely on things like the Sly 4 hate and other incidents that are absolutely my fault, and also things that never happened that they made up, but that's neither here nor there. My point is, in the years that have passed, I learned the truth. On the matter of Sly 4, my behavior has been utterly abysmal and I'm here to set the record straight today. I'm sorry to Sanzaru, Glenn Egan and Matt Kramer specifically, I'm responsible for creating an enormous amount of fighting in the Sly community. As far as I can tell, my review opened the floodgates on people hating this game, and my non-canon video is the first time that discussion ever happened, and the fanbase discourse still has to deal with that to this day. And that video didn't even get that many views. Perhaps I wasn't responsible for these things, maybe it was somebody else's video I haven't seen. And more importantly, if I hadn't done it, somebody else no doubt would have. Which means it is less about me and more about internet discourse, but the person happened to be me and I feel like my conduct in those years after the game's release was bad and I want to apologize for it, and here we are. But then that's the question. Have I learned to love Sly 4? Well, the answer to that is... not really. That's why the title has a question mark in it. No, it's more accurate to say that in becoming an adult, I learned to just stop giving a damn. Sly 4 is a well-made game with some of the finest animation I've seen in a cartoony game. It's polished to a mirror shine, it's got a truckload of content and variety, it was a clear labor of love from all involved. Sly Cooper Thieves in Time is a decent game. Hell, I can even say it's a good game at the end of the day, but it's not for me, it never was, and it never will be. 
I think it's an extremely disappointing and mediocre follow-up to the things I loved about the Sly Cooper trilogy, however, that trilogy will always exist for me to go back to whenever I feel the need, which will no doubt be a long time from now, I imagine. But moreover, Sly doesn't belong to me, I don't get to decide what Sly is, so now that Thieves in Time is 10 years old and has no sequel, I'm laying this thing to rest. I'm done hating it. It's over. It's just a video game. Hell, I may even revisit it every couple of years and play it with no dialogue and on an emulator and have a fine time. Even if I think the idea of a Sly 4 was a bad one, and I think the one we got wasn't anything like what I wanted, I'm just done making videos about these games until something new comes out and gives me something new to actually say. There is one thing I wanted to talk about with nostalgia in this video, but I think it's actually better saved for its own video coming next week. But in the meantime, do I think Sly will return? I can't imagine Sly never coming back. I mean, we do live in a culture ruled by nostalgia, after all. So I don't think it's impossible, but I am confident, almost certain, that we will never get a sequel to Sly Cooper Thieves in Time, which only becomes more true as time goes on. If Sly returns, it would no doubt be some kind of Crash-styled remake or Ratchet-styled reboot. People remember the trilogy, not really the reunion special eight years later. The sales figures on Thieves in Time backing that up. But even creatively, I think the ending of Sly 4 is a genuine dead end. I mean, you have to involve time travel to wrap up the cliffhanger of Sly 4, and at that point, is Sly now a sci-fi time-traveling series now? Or do you quickly rescue Sly and pivot towards Penelope as the main villain? Which is another terrible idea? Or would it have some time skip to Sly's son or something else? I just think Sly 5 is a conceptual nightmare and the series' story is going nowhere in particular, so it's best to just start over. But that's just how I feel about it. Every year, Sly discourse is consumed by stupid fake leaks for Sly 5 and they become more implausible with time. All I know is, whatever happens, I'll be there because Sly will never stop being an important part of my life as a game enthusiast and entertainer, but until that day comes, I'm content with everything I've said in the final four Sly reviews. And I suppose now is a good time to end the video, so I'll say what I always do. To all those that have watched this far into the video, I thank you, and look forward to seeing you next time.